are listening to Travel to Tomorrow, a podcast on the future of travel and tourism. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is your host, Marie Hardy, for Travel to Tomorrow. And today my guest of honor is Mandit Singh Soy, a famous explorer, mountaineer, environmentalist, adventurer, luxury tour operator, but has won many awards and have been a good friend for many years. Mandip, really glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Mario. Wonderful to be with you. So as Mandip, I'd like to take a little bit of time today to, for the audience to get to know you a bit more, to hopefully by the end of this half hour uh, to know uh, you as well as I do uh, over the last couple of years. But before we start, I do have a question for you. And for those of you who don't know Mendip, you'll probably wonder why I asked this question. So, what color is your turban today? <laughs> okay, Mario, normally I would have been wearing a pink or a purple or a yellow or whatever, because I love color. But uh, as, as they say sometimes, I do wear a few different hats in life. So, I'm actually wearing, believe it or not, uh, a cowboy hat as I sit and speak with you from my home in the Himalaya. Now the interesting things for those of you who've never met Mendip before, not only actually typically has a very colorful turban, but he normally also has the matching jeans. So pink, pink <laughs> jeans with pink turban or red jeans with red turban. So Mendip, it's, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. I, I always uh, say you're my most colorful friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, and 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 I hope it is, uh, you know, all the, all the good colors uh, and not the colorful personality. Sometimes, as they say, in inverted commas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, very good, Mandip. You you started your company Ibex Expedition, if I'm not mistaken, in in 1979, and um, yes. What, uh, what actually brought you to this sector? Were, were your family working in travel and tourism before, or how, how did you end up in this sector? Ah, um, well, actually quite by accident. And, uh, you know, as they say, uh, in, in our days, which is, I'm talking of the mid to late 70s, which is when I was in university, I actually went to Delhi University to uh, join the foreign service or the administrative service, the civil services in India. And having done a master's in history, that was the kind of, you know, chosen path as it was, uh, you know, given nudges by parents or family or friends, etc. But uh, I, I think over a period of time, what had happened was that right from high school, um, I'd been involved in the world of outdoors and expeditions and climbing in the Himalaya. And, you know, so I got so involved that suddenly after my master's, I decided, uh, well, this was the time to choose that path, as it were. And this idea of doing something in the adventure tourism field was very nascent, but it had just started in Nepal. And I wondered if, you know, one could take a bit of a risk as most adventure or mountaineer people do. And uh, that led to uh, basically my starting uh, this little company with uh, a couple of friends. And uh, the, the, the seed capital was, you know, like a thousand rupees or something, which is less than $20. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's how I, I got into it, really. And when, when we were a young kid, is that something you've always dreamed you wanted to do? or? Um, um, sorry, you mean the tourism part? Yes. And No, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I, I obviously got involved with uh, the world of outdoors. My school principal was an Everest climber, and I went to a public school in uh, New Delhi and uh, went on to do my college in Delhi as well, where there was a very active hiking club. My dad was in the army, so, you know, he was a paratrooper. So the sense of adventure and going out and adventure holidays was very close to me. And I, I used to quite enjoy the fact that, you know, in a sense, you were partaking in a physical adventure, but also the mental, uh, you know, part of strengthening yourself and to say, 
you know, uh, can you get out of a difficult spot? How do you deal with obstacles and so on? So there's a lot of life learning. And I guess, uh, you know, that plus the beauty of the nature, the, the fauna, the flowers, I guess, you know, the whole thing is so intoxicating that um, when, when I finished my master's, um, I, I actually took a year off and I tra- backpacked into Europe and wanted to hone in my skills on climbing and skiing and trekking and what have you. And that's when I made a choice. And I said, look, I mean, you know, either I start this little adventure travel oriented uh, company or I go and, you know, take the exam. So basically gave it a shot. And um, I I have to say, you know, one has been blessed and uh, one's never really uh, look back and one's always been happy being in this, um, you know, space in life. Yeah. I, uh, I follow you on, on Facebook and I, I see quite often, you know, you post uh, pictures of uh, beautiful nature scenes and et cetera. And it's just specifically at this time where I've been, you know, in I rise building for several months, I'm, I'm dying to actually go in, and uh, in nature and visit again. So i um, always, uh, Keep an eye on actually what you're posting to give me inspiration for maybe my next uh, my next holidays. Um, uh, thanks, Mario. It, that's that's nice of you to say that. And I think you know you're you're surrounded by a lot of people in the world of tourism that are obviously you know so so accomplished, and it's a wonderful community to be in. And and I'm sure you you can always walk through some very exciting doors as soon as uh, you know this. COVID pandemic is over. Yes, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm planning in my head for my, my next uh, few trips of the places I want to go and they, they, all, they all involve nature. I, I want to escape cities <laughs> for at least for a little while to, to yes. go and uh, explore the nature again. Um, right. I also understand your, your wife has actually been working with, along your side for, for many years with, with the organization. So, um, is this something she also wanted to do or has just happened as, as things moved along? Yeah, I mean, again, what I was lucky. We, we kind of got married in 1985 and she formally joined me in uh, 1992 uh, because we also ran another enterprise which was to do with manufacturing outdoor gear. But that was a little bit too early in its time. So, you know, I sold that business and then I asked Danita, who's basically an artist and a graphic designer. So she had her own little business going, but she was more than happy to uh, jump in because, you know, as, as a couple, we, we really enjoyed travel, tourism, traveling and meeting different people and, you know, all the experiences. She had gone to a boarding school in the foothills of the Himalaya herself. And so it was very nice and uh, kind of, uh, logical for us to be together on on the business front as well, and uh, she's been you know a great uh, source of strength and inspiration right through, and in fact uh, she helped us broaden ourselves from just adventure travel that we were originally to uh, getting into the more sort of tailor made experiences for you know the cultural and the luxury and the more offbeat and special interest journey so yeah it's been it's been actually quite a nice uh, journey and uh, we just clocked 41 years together as a couple uh, no as a business and uh, a little bit less i think 35 as a couple and uh, we still talk to each other <laughs> well every time i've seen you, you <laughs> the two of you together you always smile and always they seem to be very happy so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you, you've had some fantastic time together over all these years. Uh, Thanks, um, yeah. you, you've mentioned about uh, tailor-made uh, travel and uh, very often when, when uh, I do public speeches and talk about the industry in general, I, I very often quote uh, IBEX expeditions and yourself and, uh, and, and actually still today producing these very, very tailor-made uh, trips and expeditions for for individuals that actually meet their physical capabilities as well as their their interests, uh, which I actually find really interesting in a world where everything keeps moving to 
digital and artificial intelligence and et cetera, um, where we still have that very deep human touch and understanding of what the actual customer really wants, um, which I think makes you, you know, amongst many, many uh, others that actually offer similar services, but some, something a little bit unique in, in today's environment. What, what are, I mean, you must have seen enormous changes since 1979 in the industry. What, um, what is the biggest change in your opinion? Well, I think, uh, Mario, yeah, thank you uh, for all of that. And, and it's, a, it's a real pleasure to actually also be part of not just Sparta, but, you know, which has been one of our favorite associations, which we belong to for a very long time. But uh, a lot of other like-minded associations where uh, people value the fact that you do work for sustainability or you do work in tailor-made experiences, which are, uh, you know, more resonant to uh, being a little bit true to the experience you want to deliver, because that's what I believe, uh, you know, travel and tourism uh, operators or companies ought to be really doing. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm afraid uh, I'm not the biggest fan of mass tourism. Um, and I'm hoping, of course, that many things will change on that front as well. But um, yeah, if, if, if I've seen anything that is a big change, uh, I would say it's the two-sided coin, which uh, allows me to feel, A, very happy that tourism has grown and has become such a potent force for good because I know having sat on many judging panels of, you know, uh, great work that companies are doing worldwide to, to allow, you know, environment to be protected or communities to get help or wildlife to be preserved. So all that is so wonderful. But if I've seen the, the flip side of that coin is, of course, the fact that the Achilles heel is the negative impacts that tourism creates. And I, I could never imagine when we started uh, in 79, that even in the space of adventure travel, that it would grow to become so big. And at times, you know, uh, we can almost uh, sort of feel guilty of making adventures travel also a little bit mainstream. And I don't want to sound very uh, you know, snobbish about it or elitist to say that it should be restricted. But if it was done with much more responsibility, then I would be a happier person. And I think, to my mind, the, the expansion that I've seen even in our space probably uh, constitutes the biggest uh, change that I uh, find, you know, apart from the obvious very obvious technology stuff, which, you know, we, we used to hammer away at a telex in those days. And now we have, you know, internet. And of course, those are given. But uh, yeah, in, in the real world, that, that is what I would say. You know, you, you talked about uh, sustainability, protection of the environment a little bit. And I know that you started a few years ago to uh, travel to Antarctica uh, and uh, uh, you and I talked about several times of me joining one of your expeditions, and I will one day. I just hope that it's not too late <laughs> um, yes. to come and join you on that expedition. It is the one place in the world that I've not been yet, but I, I you know it's on my bucket list of places to go. I, I am actually, as I mentioned to you before, very, very worried about the, the Drake Passage. Um, yes. I'm not really good on, on, on boats and ships. Um, but apart from that, is, is t tell me more about... Um, why you started Expeditions to Antarctica, and then you had a specific message you wanted to give to the world also when you started. Yes. Uh, so, Mario, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, whilst Ibex Expeditions has always been what is typically referred in the travel industry as an inbound operator, which means getting people into India, uh, we also decided that it was time with the growing Indian customer interest in traveling abroad. Um, in fact, about 28 million travel abroad and we get about, you know, uh, 15 or 18 million coming in, I believe. Uh, so we thought that keeping the same genre of tailor-made experiences and of going to places which are, you know, not necessarily the first thing that you see uh, on the tourist map, 
So why not explore some of those destinations? So, you know, we started looking at Mongolia, Madagascar, Chile, and so on. And Antarctica naturally was a, a logical sort of a destination, which is absolutely, I mean, you know, we, we feel so sorry that we couldn't nick you in time. But um, one day, if, if uh, you were to get to the Antarctic, you would realize that um, it is the most amazing spot on this planet. I have to say, uh, you know, I've been to all the seven continents and been on various uh, adventures and expeditions. And uh, I must put that as one very special part of this planet. And our goal with, with uh, these expeditions or these journeys, which are done uh, for travelers, is really to, in many cases, we try and attach something of a higher purpose to the journey. So, you know, even if people come and uh, they can put a little few dollars to an NGO or uh, for a conservation thing or a school, that's doing some good. But every now and then, uh, especially with the Antarctic journeys, we've sort of signed up to try and help create the awareness of people to say that, you know, in 2048, the Antarctic Treaty will come down, which means that so far it's a no man's land, no governments own any part of it except for research stations. And you can't do any mining, you can't exploit it for any commercial use. But in 2048, when the treaty goes down and in 2041, it comes down for a renegotiation on mining rights, we are trying to make every traveler who goes there an ambassador for protecting the Antarctic or being aware that, you know, we need to do everything, uh, both in terms of civil society and governments to, to make sure that, you know, it's never exploited. And this was actually a great idea started by a polar explorer called Robert Swan. And like him, I think we need to expand this to all the companies that, you know, promote uh, trips to the Antarctic so that by building civil pressure, by actually talking to governments to say, guys, let's become more sustainable in our own country so that we, you don't need to go to places like Antarctica uh, to exploit it. Otherwise, you know, there will be a, a rise in sea levels. There'll be microclimate changes. Ice shelves are breaking. And we know the whole story of, you know, the global environmental issues. So one hopes that it is not just the minor sort of, uh, you know, tourism impact you have whilst you go there, because obviously you're going by ship and, you know, although they are very small ships, the, the greater good is much larger. And then we can get, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and God willing, we get people from different walks of life and we can all make a little difference to, to the greater goal. So one day I hope, Mario, you can come and push you know, the world of travel and tourism and PATA and all of them to take pledges to protect Antarctica. I, I look forward to it. I, I've heard, I, I've been told that actually one of the most amazing things of being in Antarctica is absolute silence. Uh, there is no noise pollution and you can only enjoy nature in its, in its true, um, you know, as it is. So um, yes. I certainly look forward to it. So would, would you say that of all the places you've been in the world, and you've been to many, many places around the world, do you have a favorite one? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, if I, if I don't sound, uh, I mean, next to Antarctica, I would say uh, what is in my own uh, little backyard, in a sense, is, is the Himalaya, of course. And, uh, you know, there are some uh, valleys that are absolutely so beautiful. And one of them, uh, which is my favorite, is actually quite popular now. It's called the source of the river Ganges in the Gangotri Valley, which is where uh, the Ganges River comes from. And around the Ganges, around the glacier, it's at around, you know, maybe four and a half thousand meters, which is typically the base camp. It's just surrounded by these beautiful uh, peaks all around, you know, which are about 
21 or 22,000 feet high. And it is the most magnificent uh, spot, uh, you know, according to me in the Himalaya. So yeah, that, that I hold pretty close. And I've, I've done some climbing there and trekking and, you know, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And the good thing is that uh, many people who are even going off on a first time trek can actually do that walk to uh, this famous meadow called Tapovan which is be below a mountain called Shivling, which is actually called the Matterhorn of the East. And it looks a bit like Matterhorn, but much more magnified at 21,000 feet. So I would put that pretty close to my heart. And the one place that you've not been yet that you really like to go? Aha. Uh -huh. So we are plotting and planning as we speak to visit the Arctic uh, in the Svalbard region, although I've been to the Arctic in the Canadian Arctic area, uh, you know, not far from the North Pole when we were on an environmental expedition studying the ozone hole, etc. But the Arctic is some, uh, you know, in the Svalbard, which is this wonderful island uh, north of Scandinavia, um, is something we want to try and do actually next summer if, if the coast is clear vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, this COVID and the protocols and so on, uh, we would love to lead a trip there. And after we do it personally, then, you know, the company kind of promotes it every year. So that's what we are looking forward to because quite coincidentally, our daughter, who incidentally is also named after the Himalaya, uh, her name is Himali. She got an artist residency and spent a um, a substantial amount of time last year and uh, when we saw her images and the experiences she had had uh, you know I said to Anita my wife that look this is something we really need to get going so along with our son Imraj who's also named after the mountains um, we we hope to lead a trip there next summer so Mario if you're free uh, or <laughs> whatever i mean actually it's probably going to be september next year so you have another invite to a cold region good well i, I should be free by then because as, as you probably know i'll be leaving pata in, in may next year so i'll have plenty of time afterwards so that's quite ah. a possibility yeah um, oh, there you go uh -huh. we last summer my and my son and i spent uh, uh three weeks in uh, iceland just driving around the country and truly enjoyed it i was born in the cold i'm actually from canada and and i mean i do miss the cold i do miss the snows and i've been looking yeah, at valbar yeah. and Faroe islands or two two other areas that uh, i actually wanted to go this summer uh so how i'll have to wait for at least another year but uh, i Fantastic. do hope that uh, you and hopefully hi and uh, our families can actually do this trip next year at, um, and then I really That'll be the, so much fun, Mario. That'll be so much fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it would be. Um, tell me about your best adventure of all time. Uh -huh. Well, I, um, again, I think, uh, I, I, can we speak globally or are you talking out of India? No, globally, whichever, which, where, wherever it was, for, for whatever reason you think actually this was something that kept in that is in the back of your mind as something that is exceptional. I mean, it can be in Antarctica, which you just mentioned, or something else, but is there a, a place or a trip or, or a special occasion you've done that is really stuck in your memory? Yeah. Well, I would, I would probably put it down to a tiny, amazing spot where we went and did a sort of an adventure expedition uh, in Madagascar. And this was a few years ago where, you know, we were also lucky to be able to weave a very uh, slightly unusual trip where essentially we took these country boats. And so it was very different to, you know, my usual mountaineering or trekking or one of those things, because for me, actually the, you know, adventure Moss Guard board or whatever is, is, is wide and, um, so we decided to take country boats and go along a river in Madagascar. And for three days, we went along and camped. And we had this little 
you know, motorboat that came along carrying our supplies in the Siribina River. And um, they have these boats called the pirogues. And we sort of rode and, you know, did that for three days and did some camping, then went into an amazing World Heritage Site story called, um, it was these, uh, you know, very unusual rock formation. And uh, it, the, the name suddenly slips my mind, which is why I must be showing my age by now. But um, <laughs> it, it, it was called, oh yes, it popped in back. It was called the Singhi. The Singhi is an area where, you know, they've got these needle kind of formations. Like if you were going to, let's say the French Alps and you looked at the Aigui, uh, which are these rock needle spires. So they all bunched together, but the French have done a great job because they've also made these ropeways, you know, so you can actually travel through them. And then we went looking for these lemurs in, in the forest. And that was an amazing experience. And finally, of course, during the whole time, we are experiencing the fact that Madagascar has about 80% of all the species that you see there are endemic only to Madagascar, which is a mind boggling fact because, you know, when it came away from the main continent, uh, all those species remain uh, kind of locked in. So you don't get them anywhere else. And apart from all the amazing chameleons and the wildlife that we saw, we then ended up at the end taking a dao, uh, which is, you know, a replica of an early sailing boat between the Arab traders and the African when they used to sail these local uh, boats with the old sort of canvas sails. And we hired that out of another quirky Frenchman that we found who was building these. And we sailed along the Mozambique Channel. And then we, you know, darted for uh, octopuses and we did some snorkeling, some scuba. And it was just a kind of roller coaster of, you know, amazing experiences and fun. And we met local chieftains along the you know, coast and I mean, it was just, uh, you know, adventure packed and a, a lesser known destination, I'm afraid, even worldwide. But it is not only just a great experience, uh, you know, destination, but for us, it was just an amazing uh, trip. So that always sticks in my mind as a, you know, fabulous one that I would, you know, love to replicate perhaps one day. Yeah, yesterday we we were watching uh, French television, and it was actually uh, a whole series specifically on Madagascar yesterday. And it looked uh, that the landscape just looked absolutely amazing. So, oh, okay. Uh, and, and, yeah. and another another place on 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 my list of places to visit. So, wonderful. Um, <laughs> my next question is about anything either funny or scary that happened in one of your trips. Hmm, that is, well, <clears throat> well, I, I think um, we, we've been sort of uh, lucky so far. We haven't had too many scares, although, you know, most uh, expeditions or adventures would always um, tend to have some element of that. Funny, yeah, I can't really... Um, <laughs> Imagine, you know, if there was one particular incident that I can relate, but um, I guess, I guess at, the, at a very low end, the, the funny things that do happen is that, um, we, which probably happens in most, most of our trips that I'm accused of being a terrible punster. So as we go <laughs> along, you know, we tend to develop this uh, crazy sort of, a repartee and a, and a bit of jousting that happens amongst the team members. So that I would say is probably, you know, you, you make up as you go along, but uh, never, no, ne never, never left anyone behind or forgotten anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, yeah, that would have been e funny e actually. E either on purpose or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you know, so far we've been very lucky actually, Mario, because when I do my journeys with my wife, we, we do 
these sort of exploratory journeys to different lands uh, in order to do the first reconnaissance. And then we, you know, turn it over to the company and it becomes commercial. But uh, we, we take care of actually going with um, people we tend to know because we form this fellowship club uh, where we invite people to join in and then they are weighted and you have to apply and, you know, fill up a form of three pages of questions. And so by and large, we've, we've been very lucky to go with people who you tend never want to want to leave behind because they've been awesome. But uh, yeah, I, I can imagine if you were, you know, signing up on a big commercial trip, once in a while, you can get a bit of a pain in the butt and then you might consider that strategy of leaving somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did a, a trek in Bhutan a few years ago, and uh, I won't name the, the, the individual in case she's listening later on, but uh, there was a yeah. young, lady, young lady with us on the trip, and this is in January, so it's below yeah. zero, it's freezing at 4,800 meters. Um, yeah. And, and uh, she was very um, attached to her phone in taking selfie pictures and thought it would be a good idea to stand on a rock in the middle of the river and um, do a yoga pause and take a selfie of herself. Well, as you can right. imagine, she yeah. fell out in, in, in the river in freezing cold, completely drenched into, into the cold oh, water. <laughs> and it was a long journey to the top. So, uh, but uh, they, these situations, I'm sure, happen uh, quite often in different trips or, or similar uh, from time to time. Um, yeah, I must actually scratch my head and uh, keep a few up my sleeve now that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As we're as we're getting to to closing, um, I, I'd like to talk just very briefly. Uh, of course, everyone in this in, in in the industry now is actually having really challenging time in in this uh, current uh, situation of COVID nineteen, the pandemic. Um, and many businesses, small businesses, are actually either running out of uh, money, closing their business, uh, or having some real challenges, as none of us really know when we're all going to be tra able to travel across the world to the many beautiful places we just talked about and, and, and others. So um, in a few words, can you talk to us a little bit about how this does impact your business and how, how do you see the future? Yeah, so... Um... Obviously, Mary, we are all going through this uh, chaotic time, but I guess, you know, it's always a case of uh, trying to see, uh, you know, the, the glass half full, as it were, uh, despite any situation. And I think that is a philosophy so akin to when we go climbing, uh, that, you know, despite obstacles, you've got to figure out solutions and so on. And that's pretty much what we've been applying ourselves here. Obviously, tourism has come to a standstill for everyone. And uh, we are on what they say is, is uh, the survival mode, like for most companies. And I'm hoping and praying that uh, many can, you know, weather the storm and come out the other side. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the future obviously uh, will bounce back for tourism. We know that uh, it's going to flow. And uh, the, the few gems uh, that we all seem to think are likely to happen are, you know, that people will uh, be a little more respectful of the way they travel. Possibly the mass tourism uh, industry might take a bit of a hit and they do it uh, a little bit differently. And uh, I'm just hoping that the, the traveler themselves or himself or herself takes more responsibility just as industry needs to do. And many parts of the industry have already done that. Some are still needing to go that extra mile. But I believe that the traveler themselves, uh, you know, or himself, herself, whatever, uh, needs to be a lot more aware of his impact, both negative and positive. To, and I guess to that extent, uh, we are actually working on a campaign in India, uh, which the government has agreed in principle. And uh, actually, it's funny, as we speak, this uh, moment I get off, I'm shooting a letter off to the government, which is basically giving them the responsible traveler code uh, of, of launching a national campaign 
so that we can sensitize the traveler of tomorrow in making the right choices, right from the kind of hotels they stay in or the kind of operators they choose or the way they uh, look at noise pollution, the litter, the garbage and so on. And we hope that we can also convert it into an app so that, you know, it's easy, it's downloadable. And we might even have a feature where, you know, people can take photographs of uh, some wrongs that have been uh, happening and be the eyes and ears for tourism, whether it's garbage or whether it's tree cutting or any poaching or any of that sort. So I, I believe if, you know, the missing link to my mind has always been the traveler. And if the traveler makes the right impact, it actually even pushes the industry to do the right action. So and that's something I would, uh, you know, separately even uh, appeal to you as Pata and uh, many other associations. Actually, I'm also hoping to write to the UNWTO that the two major things that I think, uh, Mario, and time is right. I mean, we should not only have a responsible traveler situation, and obviously it means that the industry has to become more sustainable and more responsible. But I also wonder if this is not a good time for countries to actually look at doing very quick and very in-depth carrying capacity studies of their main tourism destinations so that tomorrow when we come back, we are not going to create the same kind of you know, negative impacts where we have. And so I think it's a, it's a important time. Uh, you know, we've all had to pay a very big cost, of course. But uh, from planet Earth's point of view, I think uh, we have a chance of doing things right again. So let's, let's hope for the best. Thank you very much. I, I agree with you. This is a great opportunity for us, for the industry, to um, relook at how actually it's, 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 uh, it's at its future of what is actually needed, both for the environment and also in terms of, of travel. Um, you've actually most certainly uh, through, throughout uh, this uh, discussion today uh, inspired me and I'm sure it inspired uh, lots of other people to go on an adventure, uh, hopefully with you and your organization in the future. Uh, but uh, um, thank you. It's been an honor, an absolute honor and a privilege to, to spend a bit of time with you today. Um, one last question very briefly before we go. I know that you said you're planning a trip for Zalbar next year, but before that, as we come out of, of this current situation, hopefully within the next few months, where will be your first trip? Oh. Well, you know, Mario, I have to give out a small secret. I'm actually locked up in this lockdown um, in our mountain home in the Himalaya. And for me, I think this has uh, been quite a sanctuary. So I would either come back here or I would visit one of our national parks, which is something, you know, I quite enjoy doing. So I've also got a few national parks in central India that I've, you know, chalked up to, to zip as soon as the coast is clear and hear the roar of the lion or the, or the tiger, actually. So, yeah. Mandit Singh Soy, explorer, environmentalist, mountaineer, adventurer, luxury tour operator. It's been an absolutely great honor and pleasure to have you today. I thank you for your time and I wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank Mandy. you, Mario. It was a great pleasure uh, talking to you.